Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Kuahara. I'm the team leader for CIBC's public sector and not-for-profit group. And on behalf of my colleagues at CIBC, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. We're delighted that you're able to join us for this session, which is going to address a topic that is continuing to be a major challenge for public sector and not-for-profit organizations in Canada, and that's cybersecurity and cyber fraud. It's very unfortunate, but the frequency and severity of cyber attacks in the sector is increasing. And whether those attacks are in the form of electronic transaction fraud or the hacking of patients' medical records or ransomware, these types of incidents can significantly impact your organizations. So today, my colleagues from CIBC, Susan Walstead and Jack Nuno, will discuss cyber fraud trends and examples of attack scenarios as well as some best practices you can implement to um, mitigate your risk. So by way of introduction, Susan Wellstead is Director of Education and Awareness with CIBC's Enterprise Security Team. And really part of her role involves giving presentations such as this one, both to clients and to employees to create greater awareness around cyber and fraud security issues. And our second speaker, uh, Jack Nuno, is Market Vice President with CIBC Commercial Banking, and Jack has responsibility for the bank's mid-market cash management group in Eastern Canada, and Jack's team provides cash management and treasury solutions to a broad range of clients, including many public sector and not-for-profit organizations. So uh, Susan and Jack are going to take us through a PowerPoint presentation on screen, which we'll make available to you afterwards through your CIBC Relationship Manager, and also, after they conclude their prepared remarks, we'd encourage you to ask questions by clicking the icon at the top of your screen. And on that note, uh, Susan, I'll turn things over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I, uh, I do host a lot of these calls for uh, various client bases at CIBC and, and our internal groups as well. And uh, what we've what we've been seeing over the past several years is, is just an increase in cyber crime and, and cyber fraud. Uh, so we do find it to be really beneficial to try to get ahead of it uh, by making people aware. So I'll jump right in, if I can progress my slide. <laughs> and uh, so some of the first things I, I want to talk about, and uh, I know the slide, there might be a little bit of a, a lag on the screen, um, are some of the threat actors and the tactics that we're seeing in the landscape. Um, by threat actors, we basically mean they're cyber criminals. Um, and apologize if there's a tech support gentleman on the line. I can't actually see anything. Um, but yeah, so some of our threat actors include things like hacktivists, uh, nation state actors. I'm going to take control back. Get back to my first slide here. Apologies, everyone. Um, nation state actors, uh, as well as some of our uh, hacktivist groups. So nation state actors are, are you know, some of the players we've heard about in the news, like China and the Ukraine, but also Canada and the U.S., we also have skin in the game there. Um, there's internal uh, fraudsters and, and internal cyber threats. Some are, are malicious and some of them are um, unknowing. There we go. My apologies. Organized crime is a big one as well. Um, you know, the days of, of uh, you know, horse and carriage and holdups uh, have pretty much passed, and we see that attacks are happening much more in an online space. Uh, and these attacks can be quite simple, although the uh, technology behind them is very sophisticated. So some of the kind of tactics we see are social engineering, which I'll go into a little bit more detail about later, but that includes things like phishing, which most people have heard of, those the uh, fraudulent emails that purport to be from real sources. Um, there's also uh, vishing and smishing, which are uh, voice phishing or phone fraud, as well as uh, text message phishing. And we've seen quite a bit of that in that, the text message space recently. Uh, and spear phishing, of course, is a more targeted, uh, targeted type of attack where uh, these cyber criminals, um, they look up a lot of information about particular targets. So maybe it's the a board of directors member or maybe a CEO of an organization or a president and, and target them specifically with things that that'll make them respond. Um, and some of the some of the um, items that you would see as a result of these phishing attacks are things like malware and viruses. Um, so those can infect your systems. Um, they can uh, they can take down servers. 
Uh, insider threats are a bit of an interesting one uh, where we talk about both malicious and non-malicious insider threats. So, of course, our malicious insider threats are people who um, actively and intentionally uh, plan to do harm, where our non-malicious insider threats are actually every one of us uh, because we want to do good and we, we want to be timely and we click on things that perhaps we shouldn't click on. There's some more detail there about exploits and denial of service, but there's sort of the more technical side of things. Uh, it, but suffice it to say, these are um, exploits or are, are vulnerabilities that are that are known in the wild and sometimes not known. And and it's you know when you get those uh, software update requests on your computer, and everybody likes to delay those because nobody wants to be um, offline for any period of time. Uh, but that's where uh, a lot of times, if you see there's a security update, it means that there was a vulnerability found. Uh, and by not patching or not updating um, your computer or, or allowing your your um, your OS to be updated, so your operating systems to be updated, you leave yourself vulnerable to attack. So some of the background from a cyber risk perspective, um, it, it, this is a major, major profit driven industry. Uh, we'll get into some of the numbers later, but this is a billions, billions of dollars industry. Um, so we're seeing the frequency of attacks continue on the rise, and these are profit-motivated criminals. Uh, and they're really looking to upset business and, and operations of any kind of organization, uh, including you know, all of our, our not-for-profit group, uh, including large organizations, small organizations. They're looking to steal uh, your data. So uh, healthcare records are incredibly valuable on the dark web, which is sort of the nefarious end of the internet. Uh, system availability, so that's shutting down access to sites uh, for, for CIBC, for example, that would be um, blocking access to our online banking and knowing that kind of impact and what that can do to our client base and a, and a reputation. And then, of course, fraud, um, theft and manipulation of, of information, market manipulation, and these are all, all um, threats that can then impact your reputation. Uh, regulatory bodies can come after you and of course, loss of confidence in your organization. So as I mentioned, the, the attack sophistication is, is definitely increasing. Um, and we're seeing a lot of collaboration in the space. When I talk about the dark web, this is a part of the web that's not indexed. So it's not an area you get to by Googling. This is something sort of below the layers. Uh, and cybercrime as a service is, is a trend we're seeing as well. So this means, for example, um, in the past, you'd have to have a, a real um, tech savvy mind to be able to, you know, write code and, and cause problems. And we're seeing now that people can actually buy packages of code, malicious packages of code, and have it deployed by service providers who are cybercrime service providers. Um, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a peculiar setup, but they have even support lines and things like that. So for example, um, ransomware, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. Ransomware is a, a means by which the cyber criminal gets into your system and then locks down all of your files. And they ask for um, ransom as a matter, like a way with usually payment through Bitcoin in order to unlock your files. Um, and in the past, this would have been something, again, that you'd have to have a sophisticated uh, coder in the background, you know, running this through. But now you can buy that package and it costs about $20,000, but the average ransomware payout at the end is around 180000 So you can see when you have a return on investment like that, we're up against um, groups of people who, who are just eager to really make a lot of money off of the, the backs of everyone else. I wanted to take a look at some recent examples and you'll see some come up on the screen um, with some uh, you know bigger companies that we've heard in the news as well. But uh, the data breaches and cyber crime has been targeting, we've been seeing the targeting into municipality groups a lot more uh, in the past few years, as, as Steve mentioned as well. Um, for example, um, Wasega Beach area is a, it's a small municipality north of Toronto, um, quite small. And in uh, 2018, they were victims of a ransomware attack. So their, um, all of their city records, so payroll for various services like fire service and things, everything was locked down. And it means that everybody's computer in the, uh, in, the, in the city administration offices were locked down with the same message on the screen saying, if you don't pay this ransom, 
we will destroy all of your records. They uh, did able. They were asking for about a hundred and ten or a hundred and thirty thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, um, and Bitcoin is used often because it's not traceable. Any kind of cryptocurrency tends to be untraceable, um, and the Wasaga Beach folks managed to actually negotiate with with these with this crime body, and they got the uh, the payout down to thirty four thousand dollars in Bitcoin. However, there's all these other costs that are associated with this as well. So it's not just paying out that 34,000, here's your files back. Now they have to look through, you know, the hardware setups that they have. Do they have the right security for their hardware? Do they have the right software? Do they need to have a, a security consultant group come in to do an assessment? And, and they did. Uh, and the bill started racking up. And in, uh, by the end of 2018, I think they had, they had spent about um, just over, uh, just shy of 300,000. And then in the next year in 2019, another about $100,000. So um, shy of half a million dollars for that one incident. Uh, Midland, uh, they, they were subject to a cyber attack as well. City of Burlington, uh, they had a half a million dollar phishing um, cyber attack where they ended up having, they lost uh, five, uh, half a million dollars there. Um, Stratford City Hall, they had some shutdown attempts last year as well. And, uh, and we're just seeing this, this become um, more prolific or, or more common. And these external actors, again, they're looking to exploit um, vulnerabilities that existed on the system. So a lot of ransomware takes advantage of, of maybe even not phishing, maybe even not just sending an email to someone, but actually leveraging um, gaps in the, uh, in the system that they have. And, uh, and also taking advantage of, of people inside the organization who maybe have access to data that they can take, they can steal from, from the company. So one of the, the very frustrating tactics right now is actually around COVID-19. And it, it preys on the sensitivity around this particular topic, of course. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of scams around this. And I imagine a lot of the people on the phone have probably experienced some of these as well. Uh, I've been getting threatening calls from groups purporting to be the CRA and the RCMP telling me that there are um, police outside my house which is really easy to validate by just opening my curtain. Um, and also that's really not how the CRA or RCMP function. But you can imagine that there are groups of people who just don't know that, or they, they get nervous. Sometimes it's um, you know older people, sometimes it's just people who aren't familiar with how, how a, a municipality or a hospital or a bank gets in touch with them normally. Um, so these COVID-19 attacks are, they look quite legitimate. They look like often they're emails. Um, with links to, oh, here's the latest, you know, data science on this, and you click on the link, and what's actually happening is some malware is downloading on your machine in the background. And unfortunately, there's no, there's no flags, there's no um, alerts that say this is happening often, and you don't know it's happening, and then they get access to your computer, your personal computer, or even at work, and try to find information. Maybe it's your banking information, uh, or perhaps, again, it's, it's, it's medical records or um, city records or, or things like that. Uh, and they're trying to, they're, they're kind of bringing up these old scams that we haven't seen as much recently, or hadn't seen as much recently until COVID, uh, which is these, these phone attacks. Um, and the, they're not just going after large corporations or banks. We've been watching this and, and making sure that we're alert. We actually collaborate with other banks when we talk about this kind of threat landscape. Um, this isn't a space where we compete. This is a space where we collaborate so that, you know, if, if we're seeing a particular kind of attack, we're going to be sharing that with our financial institution peers. Um, but we're seeing, uh, you know, banking, the, these cyber criminals are, are pretending to be banking officials or, or financial uh, advisors and trying to get people to disclose their financial information over the phone. Um, health and government agencies are being um, impersonated. And, uh, and the local hospitals are being impersonated. Um, and, and again, this is, this is coming up with the, well, the CRA and the RCMP. Unless they have a, a, you know, an outpost right by my house, I don't know why I get calls every day saying that they're right there. So I'm just trying to get access to, there we go. So I want to talk about some of the other um, types of fraud and, and 
while check fraud is not what we would call a cyber crime, it actually very much links into it because a lot of um, a lot of the the mentality behind it is the same or they'll they'll leverage something like a phishing attempt and to get you to disclose certain information in order to um, perpetrate check fraud. Uh, so this is uh, checks that are, you know, we, we we know we're moving away from checks, but with things like remote deposit capture on our phones uh, and, and even at uh, certain kind of businesses, uh, we do see that check fraud is, is continuing. And uh, the cyber criminals are taking advantage of a couple of things. Sometimes it's it has to do with the delay in processing of a check or clearing of a check. Um, and sometimes it's it's just the ease of, of being able to, to alter something. So um, we've seen just to run through them quickly, because I know it's not a big use, but um, I know even with, uh, you know, I have, I have friends and relatives who, who have small businesses and and they end up using um, checks with vendors and things for services rendered. Uh, worthless deposits and check kiting, um, the checks with no value, and uh, and fraudsters take advantage of the the funds and the funds on hold in order to um, so the the check is deposited but it has no value or it's not even a valid check but they withdraw the money right away. Altered checks, of course, are ones where the the paid name and and amounts are are altered. You can um, scratch this off if anyone ever saw. That film, Catch Me If You Can, or heard of Frank Abagnale. These are the same tactics that were deployed 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, where they just they use chemicals to lift or adjust the, the lettering on checks. Uh, counterfeit checks, of course, with that, that just hold the same um, serial number and just repeat it over and over again. And then forged endorsements, of course, which is the uh, signature, uh, just forging signatures. And then moving into wire fraud, um, so these schemes are, are becoming more common. There's wire fraud, electronic fraud, or even kind of that, uh, like the, the Western Union kind of fraud. And um, just as a, a personal aside, the reason I, I joined um, CIBC's security team, I actually came from a technology background, is my parents were victims of two cyber crimes in a single year. And one of them was a wire fraud, um, where they were... Um, victims of what they call the grandparent scam where a relative calls you and the phone is cut off and and they were told that uh, in order to to secure bail or or get a bail hearing they had to wire money immediately and it created a big panic and and what a lot of times these wire frauds start from is a, a sense of urgency or a sense of um, panic and and so that you're responding not how you normally would not taking the care you would normally take in order to actually um, check who the person is requesting uh, so sometimes these are a long kind of game where trust is set up over a matter of months and then they, they have you wire money. We've heard about things like romance scams and things like that. Um, but these can happen in organizations or to personal um, personal accounts as well. And we'll talk more about business email, business email compromise because that one in particular um, we've seen has impacted and, and I can give you a bit of an example of, of uh, uh, one of the healthcare providers in Ontario who ran into this just recently. Um, so in some cases, again, they, these are perpetrated by um, people gaining access to someone's uh, work email account. And sometimes it's about um, just slightly altering it, right? So it would be Susan.Wellstead from C1BC.com instead of CIBC. But maybe you didn't see that it was a one and not an I and taking advantage of kind of some of the... Uh, the, the differences in font. And, and as I mentioned before, in terms of how prolific this is and, and how profitable it is, 12 billion between um, October 2013 and 2018 in wire fraud. And that was, um, we're still trying to get the numbers now because the, that 12 billion in between those dates, I don't even think scratches the surface of what's happened in, in since May 2018 to date. So let's take a look, um, a bit of a deeper look at what I mentioned earlier, business email compromise or BEC. These are coming up in the news um, a lot more frequently as well. And we're seeing um, seeing how groups can be victimized by this. So for how this really works, there's, a, there's actually three types. One is a CEO fraud, which we'll walk through um, an example. One is a vendor um, fraud, and then one is basically like an impersonation of an employee, so an impersonation fraud. And uh, and the the healthcare facility that I was mentioning, um, they ran into a situation where uh, 
an employee's email account had been hacked. And they were, the cyber criminal was intervening in the middle of um, conversations about where a paycheck should be routed or if an account should be changed. And there was a request that came from the cyber criminal sort of sitting in the middle of the communication. So if you think of the employee on one end and payroll on the other end, um, this this particular uh, threat actor sat in the middle of that. And it's kind of like a man in the middle attack is actually a turn of phrase that we use. And actually was... Uh, rerouting emails that were coming back from payroll trying to clarify are, are you sure is that the transit is at the right place to go so that the employee was never actually seeing that side of the communication but the payroll was never seeing the side of the communication that actually came from the employee and it happened repeatedly and money was moved to a, an account that wasn't the employee's account so they basically ended up paying out for a period of time um, to a couple accounts that weren't actually owned by the employees and the part that's the hardest to get your head around is how many checks and balances you can put in place. But when the email looks like it's coming from the employee, it's the right email that you can check in their directory and that's the right person. Um, the person on the other end on the payroll side feels like this is valid. We'll give you some, we'll talk through a couple of tips on how to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but know that, you know, the, these cyber criminals, when we're talking in the billions of dollars of profit, uh, they, they definitely... Um, <laughs> they try to stay one step ahead. So a business email compromise, um, the first step really is just identifying the target. So as I mentioned before, this can be done through a number of different ways, but one of the, the easiest things to do is look online. Um, we tend to post information on different platforms and different amounts of information, and it doesn't take a lot to start um, aggregating that information. So your LinkedIn profile and your Facebook and your Instagram and what other chat bot type things that you use and build a profile of who you are. It's very easy to go on LinkedIn and see, oh, well, Susan Wells said works for enterprise security and well, what might I have access to? I'd, I'd feel bad if they hacked my account. They'd just get a bunch of PDFs trying to educate people, but maybe that would make them learn something. But for someone like a CEO, they might have access to major client lists or, or someone in a, in a healthcare facility who has access to those healthcare records that are super valuable um, online. Or maybe it's about um, account numbers where a particular munis municipality is, is sending large, um, large dollar transactions to. So the second step is that grooming. So using that spear phishing, also some phone calls to try to target someone in a company. Um, payroll is often hit up. Finance is definitely hit up. Um, anybody who, who has the ability to enact transactions. And then, of course, in step three, exchanging the information. Um, here's the new transit. Here's the account I need you to send that to um, and, and kind of creating a bit of a story behind it. And then the wire transfer occurs. And the trouble with wire transfers, as much as they are super convenient, is that they're very hard to roll back. When you complete a wire transfer, it's a very complete, it's, it's a very closed loop kind of transaction. Um, we would say that if you run into that and, and you feel like you've been a victim of something like that, and the sooner you can notify uh, your financial institution and, um, and, and proper like uh, policing bodies, do it. The faster you react and respond, um, even if you, maybe you're only suspicious and maybe you're not really sure, the faster you respond, the faster a bank can respond or a financial institution can respond or a vendor can respond. So an example of this CEO fraud, um, which is a very common one, and, and it can be like any high ranking official. We've, we've seen this um, with a number of, of, of clients as well, where someone at the high end of the, um, of the organization is basically impersonated. So uh, in this example, accounts payable receives an email from a fraudster pretending to be the CEO requesting an urgent wire transfer. Um, there's this sense of urgency. And, and as I mentioned, we all want to do good. We all want to do well. And so often these emails don't come, you know, at, at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday when you have time to validate something. And they almost always come with a sense of urgency. So there should be an example of it that'll come up on your screen. And this is, this is actually a real example. Um, and we have a number of them. Um, we did change the name of the companies that were listed just to make it a little bit, you know, less poignant. But uh, yeah, so you'll see that the, they're asking for an immediate wire and that the person that you're trying to 
you know, that you would normally validate with is on vacation and, and not reachable. And sometimes it'll be that they, you know, they don't have a phone or their phone was stolen or something like that. Um, and and the, the red flags are really about the, the urgency and the fact that it's creating a response, an emotional type response or an urgency type response that you normally wouldn't have for a transaction that was, you know, transferring money. Um, and that it's just not a normal, it's it's not something that a, a, an executive would necessarily do is reach out for a, a wire transfer like that to another employee. Um, and, and we did have that occur um, with some clients as well, where uh, there was a VP who had sent an email to payroll saying, look, I just got off the phone with HR and they told me to contact you specifically. Um, I'm traveling. I can't get to a computer again today. I need you to, I found out my, my account's been hacked. My bank account's been hacked. I need you to send my paycheck. That's, you know, payroll cutoff is in like three hours. I need you to send my paycheck um, to this new account. And the payroll um, payroll associate felt uncomfortable with it and and the transit number seemed strange it seemed to be missing a digit uh so they did what we want you to do which is they picked up the phone and tried to call that particular vp um and the vp's response was very much in line with what are you talking about i don't i'm not i'm away but i there's no problem with my account as far as i know and had that had that associate not made that phone call the money could have been rerouted similar to what happened in that um that other uh, healthcare facility. So they're, they're, they're intentionally tricky, very intentionally tricky. And picture this the same with something like a, a supplier scam, right? So a vendor scam. Um, and there's, uh, what was her name? Um, Barbara Korn from Shark Tank, uh, does the investor type stuff. Uh, she came out a little while ago too, where, where they admitted that um, her payroll or her um, accounts payable group uh, was hit up by what appeared to be a phishing attempt, and they were asked to pay um, a, a particular vendor a particular amount of money and you know, an account. Here's the account, and you know Jeff is off of work now, but I'm taking over this account, so please send this money to this account. And it was four hundred thousand dollars, and the, um, the 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 accounts payable it seemed valid. It was the right company name. Um, they knew who the previous person they were supposed to be dealing with was, and they completed the transaction. Uh, it, it really, there is nobody this targets in particular. This targets everyone. And and that idea of validating the transaction through an, a trusted alternative method is is really key for us here. So the person who um, never never accept those kind of instructions, and, uh, and Jack will go through some of this as well, but never accept those kind of instructions on an email alone. Um, even with uh, what happened with my parents, had they made one phone call, uh, to the relative who who was supposedly incarcerated, they would have known that while, yes, he was in Montreal at the time, and that's where the call came from, uh, he was fine, and he was out with co-workers having a grand old time. Um, but just making that one phone call to validate, and maybe it's more than one phone call, maybe it's not, maybe it's a matter of also going to Google and checking out, does this, does this person even work for that company? And just knowing to trust your gut a little bit when when you feel like something might be suspicious. And with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Jack Nuno, who will take you through um, what to do if you happen to suspect something has gone sideways on you, and also some preventative um, and protective actions. Thanks okay. very much, Susan. Um, I'm assuming, uh, Susan, can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, perfect. And I believe I have taken over the presentation to you. So uh, once again, my name is Jack Nuno, and I'm in our CIBC's cash management sales uh, group. Um, you know, thanks again to Susan. And there really is so much to talk about here that we could, as everyone think, I think knows, could spend hours on these topics. Um, but I will take a few minutes now to touch on some preventative measures and best practices that almost all organizations can implement. And, and Susan did touch on a, on a couple of things already. But I, I will start with first and foremost, uh, let's get right to what to do if, unfortunately, you do in, uh, in fact become a victim. And that is, as Susan mentioned, that the first thing to do if you do become a victim of a, a wire fraud, electronic funds transfer fraud, is, 
as soon as possible to contact your financial institution. And uh, when I say that, I mean your relationship manager, your cash management representative, the fraud department. Uh, the sooner that you are able to contact us, the better. Now, although wires, for example, as Susan mentioned, are considered final and irrevocable once the receiving financial institution has received them, our fraud department, in conjunction with fraud departments at other banks worldwide, will together on a best effort basis do everything possible to retrieve the funds before the fraudsters are able to get away with your money. Um, time is of the essence, obviously, in these situations. So that needs to happen quickly. And, and this will touch into some of the best practices that we talk about too. Um, so depending on several factors, there is a chance that we may be able to get back your money. And, and again, I put lots of uh, may and chance around that, but uh, the sooner you let us know or your financial institution know, the better. Okay, uh, get right into some preventative measures. I, I always start this discussion re regarding preventative measures by stating a phrase that people around me are, are surely tired of hearing, and that is that old world solutions to new world problems. It is a very high tech world that we live in today, uh, as we all know and we're, we've just been talking about. And although there are definitely a lot of very sophisticated hackers out there who, like in the movies, uh, plop themselves into a computer with multiple screens, uh, there's data flying around like in the Matrix movies, and they punch away at their keyboards for a few minutes and they figure out how to break through some major firewall and breach cybersecurity systems. The, the reality is that the majority of breaches, in fact, occur from fraudsters taking advantage, uh, advantage of the weakest link in our workplace and at home, and that is us, human beings. We are the weakest link, and that is the easiest way for these fraudsters to get in and then wreak havoc. So many of the preventative measures that we discuss with our clients and that experts in cybersecurity preach are ultimately common sense, low cost, and simple. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that the high tech firewall solutions and, and everything that the experts talk about are, are real valid and need to be in place if possible, but there's a lot we can all do to protect ourselves. They don't require huge investments, but they do require attention and focus from senior levels of your organization. So looking at, at some of the measures, and I'm going to go right to what I consider, in my opinion, let's say to be the uh, top three non-high tech measures, as I call them. And Susan alluded to this already. I, I would say first and foremost, verbally confirm any financial transactions, including changes to payment structures, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, I can't, so simple, and I can't overemphasize how important that is. The various types of business email compromise that Susan touched upon, uh, I don't wanna say without question or without exception can be prevented by a simple phone call, but I'll say it's pretty darn close. Uh, that, that phone call to a person that you know, that you recognize, a phone number that you have on record, not a phone number that someone else has given you, uh, a phone number to get through to the CEO who told you uh, via email to, to, to complete a, fra a, a wire transaction, whatever it might be. I know it sounds so, so simple, but a phone call, a live phone call in a conversation uh, can resolve so many of the problems that we are running into. Secondly, is have a dual approval process for financial transactions. Again, very, very important. Uh, again, I, I hate to make a statement, but I'll say 
that I would say that the majority of internal and external frauds uh, uh, could be avoided or at least um, uh, significantly mitigated by having strong dual approval processes in place. And when I say dual appro approval processes in this regard, I'm speaking of electronic dual approver processes. And not only is that the situation, let's say a more common situation where uh, a, a person who creates a wire payment on an online banking system or an electronic funds transfer uh, is not the person who is allowed to approve it. It must be a second uh, different person who approves that payment. But not only that, but it could also uh, and, and should be also that the person who, for example, creates a wire template that is used to pay a vendor. If a person changes a wire template or creates a new wire template, then that, uh, that very uh, transaction, although in itself is not a, a transaction where funds are leaving the organization, that can, at least on CIBC's uh, cash management online, can and should be set up to have a creator and an approver. <clears throat> we, we recently, in the last two weeks, had yet another client who was uh, a victim of a, B, uh, a business email compromise fraud, the very common one that Susan mentioned, or one of the very common ones, where they received an email with a very difficult to um, uh, discover email address that was very, very slightly different than the real one. And, <clears throat> and uh, uh, praying on the COVID situation, used some excuses around COVID to tell the accounts payable person that they had changed their banking information and that, you know, please forward payments for the uh, upcoming shipments of medical uh, uh, devices and such to this new email address, or sorry, to this new uh, bank and bank account. Unfortunately, the accounts payable person did not uh, verify by live phone call that this was the proper uh, and the real uh, supplier. And as Susan mentioned, everything, everything looked fantastic and, and correct, but she did not uh, verify via phone call. So the person went ahead and made, uh, over a period of two weeks, not only one, but four separate wire payments. And in the end, the organization uh, lost over 360,000 US dollars out of that. And a simple phone call could have avoided that. Furthermore, had that, uh, and I'm not saying they were or were not, but in the case of, of something that sometimes we don't think about, had that company had a dual approver uh, process in place for changing of the wire template, then when the accounts payable person changed the wire template, they someone else would have had to uh, approve that. And so let's say it was a manager, and at least that would give the manager an opportunity to consult with the accounts payable person to ensure that the proper double check had taken place. So dual approvers uh, uh, process is extremely important. And at CIBC, uh, we are, are, I'll say, very um, insistent on this and require our clients, except for in very exceptional circumstances, to have dual approval processes in place on their online platform. Uh, third one I'll say is the implement an employee cybersecurity and fraud training and testing program. Uh, that is, again, uh, very, very low cost and very important. And, and it touches into something on the best practices also. But if employees are trained properly, then it helps avoid and mitigate uh, the top two items on this list, which are, you know, think before you click and be suspicious of unfamiliar screens or requests. 
the training is very, very important because the other part it does is that, uh, and I'll touch on this on the next screen, is that it demonstrates to the employees of an organization that cybersecurity and fraud awareness is top of mind and is part of the culture. And there have been many studies that show that the more prevalent, and this applies for general security and theft measures too, that the more prevalent there is a culture of controlled uh, processes, of awareness of cybersecurity, of regular fraud, of everything, the, the studies show that those organizations uh, uh, correlate very strongly to having overall less incidences of fraud. So it's very important. And the testing program part is also something that can be implemented at, at uh, uh, I'll say, relatively low cost, where, where the organization itself, with, whether or not you have an IT department, but let's say you do have an IT department or an IT person, that person is responsible for occasionally sending uh, uh, test fraudulent emails within the organization to see what people will in fact click on things that they're not supposed to click on. And it's a very, very effective tool. Uh, we do that at CIBC all the time for our employees. And again, uh, studies show that organizations that, that uh, have training and also uh, implement testing programs uh, show great improvements in the, um, uh, well, the improvements or, 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 uh, or um, the other way around as far as people not clicking and acting smartly and intelligently when it comes to uh, phishing exercises and uh, business email compromise situations. So the, the other uh, items on here, uh, again, are are, I, I won't get into detail on them, but but they're all uh, strong and and I say common sense preventative measures. The next slide I'll look at is best practices. Uh, I already I touched on it, and so I won't go into it, but but uh, in detail again. But uh, it's very important to have a culture of strict controls and cybersecurity practices, and and that starts with senior management and people inside the organization knowing that this is important to senior management. It does result in a, in a, uh, a shown uh, lower rate of both internal and external fraud. I would say also to be diligent, to take advantage of, of many available and often free of charge resources to help miti mitigate your risk of fraud. Um, Similar to the preventative measures on the previous slide, I, I'm sure you already know about many of these best practices that are listed here. Antivirus and anti-malware software up to date. Uh, it's amazing how many organizations are breached by viruses and malware that have already been identified by the various protection softwares but the organization has failed to update their protection software in a timely basis and then become victim to that fraud. Uh, reconciling bank accounts daily. Uh, again, I know that in, in certain organizations and staffing issues and such that, that you may say, oh, you know what, we, we just do not have the, the resources to, to be, um, uh, uh, reconciling accounts on a daily basis. But I, I want to say again that it is so, so important. Um, often an organization and a person who, who takes a look at the accounts doesn't in fact need to do a very detailed cross-check uh, uh, strike and uh, match on the account rec reconciliation. I think many of us, like when we look at our our visa statement, even not to oversimplify this, but a glance down on a daily basis at transactions that went through your account. Someone who knows the accounts uh, can can often uh, very quickly identify something that doesn't look like it should be there. So daily reconcil reconciliation is very important. 
And and again, it ties into that ability to let us or your FI, your financial institution know of issues. Uh, I think the, the last thing I just want to point out on this slide, uh, and we'll, we're going to be leaving you with all this uh, information or you're, you're able to get it uh, through your, your relationship management team. But let's not forget, as Susan mentioned, let's not overlook that check fraud is still extremely popular amongst fraudsters and remains a leading fraud mechanism. Uh, like it's right up there. It doesn't make the uh, newspapers and the headlines, but it is still something that is very, very important and you cannot ignore. Okay, uh, just start to the next slide here. Uh, I guess the, 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 the next few slides, I'm not going to go into detail. I'm going to leave it with you. And I will at the end also uh, point you to a link that that is on the CIBC.com that has some very, very good uh, information for you. But what I will reiterate that Susan already mentioned is to be aware of and train your employees to be aware of any emotional reaction to an email or a phone call. And I mean any emotional reaction, a reaction of fear, of excitement, of happiness or sadness should be an immediate warning signal to take a step back because the fraudsters want you to get into that other part of your brain where you're not thinking logically and rationally and you're thinking on emotion and doing things that you would never do. So that is, uh, uh, again, another very simple one, but it is so, so true. Um, the only thing I would point out here is that, that again, make sure to regularly back up your data. Again, another very, very simple one, but secure backups, as it says here, uh, are insurance against ransomware. Uh, again, I, I will leave you with the other couple of slides here, how to stay safe online, and also how to stay safe on the go with mobile. Uh, again, all of this information and more detailed can be found via the link that is shown on uh, slide 19 that I have right up, I uh, have up now. Uh, so I encourage you to, to please uh, go to that website and uh, there's a lot of excellent information on there of tips and guidelines and, and preventative measures and so on and so forth. So with that, uh, Steve, uh, I'm done. Uh, I, I will open it up now to folks. If you have uh, any questions, please uh, uh, please go ahead. Actually, Steve, I, I don't recall now. Uh, I know you can do the questions online. Are people also able to ask questions uh, via audio? Uh, no, Jack. I think the best way to uh, ask a question, there's a little icon with a person with their hand up in the top right corner of people's screens. If you click on that, you'll be able to type in a question. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Maybe while we're waiting for people to ask questions, I have one for, for Susan. And uh, Susan, you, you were mentioning that CIBC collaborates with the other banks. Like, are there any major trends in terms of how corporate Canada is responding to the increase in cyber fraud? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we've seen quite a few uh, sort of new organizations and, and government organizations trying to step in here as well and, and creating these um, cyber cyber safe um, sort of education tools for, for corporate Canada. Um, in terms of actual organizations collaborating, I haven't, I haven't heard as much of that. Um, but again, as we see these, like, for example, there's the Canadian Bankers Association. I'm a member of Cyber Citizens Awareness Group there. Um, and we have a number of organizations across, you know, banking as well as uh, insurance and things who, who all actively collaborate. So I think there's probably some starting to crop up as, as well as, as these government sites get up and running. And the CyberSafe program is actually pretty phenomenal. And, and, uh, and that's trying to pull some of the groups together. Um, and then with the uh, some of the other team members in our enterprise security and risk services, 
uh, work alongside some of the universities as well as RCMP um, to try to pull some of that material and try to have a uniform message. Um, and, and again, that usually comes from intelligence that's fed in through whether it's the, um, the Canadian fraud group or, or these different sort of cyber platforms. Okay, well, it doesn't look like we have any questions registered at this time, so maybe maybe you've covered everything. Um, so maybe that or we've scared everyone. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's true. Oh, actually, we have one. Oh, we do have a yeah. great. Uh, so, so we do have a uh, uh, let's see, our question, and and I guess it's more of a uh, comment too. Uh, the comment coming in uh, says, in case of oh. And now it just disappeared on me. In case of a phone call, I usually ask the person for their phone number to call back so it gives me time to check, or sometimes they hang up the call. So mm. there's another little tip too. And and you know, uh, again, you know, uh, Susan mentioned something too that I, I forgot to mention is that uh, if you're if you have any whiff of of something doesn't smell right, uh, Google it because. Yeah. Because by the time it hits you, and I, I don't want to say in all likelihood, there's a good likelihood that that it's already made it onto the web, yeah. and 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 this has happened to me several times where something didn't sound right or whatever. I Google it, and bang, it pops up all over the place as being a scam. Yeah, and the government actually has a. It's called the Little Black Book of Scams, and it's on the um, Canadian Government of Canada website. But if you just Google Little Black Book of Scams um, and and open those up, you'll see the ones I mentioned about the romance scam and the the grandparents scam and the business email compromise. Those are all those are all in there and detailed in there as well. So you're right. Most of the time, you're not the first victim. Um, Steve, I, I see we've had a, a couple of uh, questions about copy of the presentation. Do you want to just address that again? Sure. And I guess sure. let's looking at the um, the time. It's 11.53. There are a couple of questions about the availability of the presentation, which I'll address in a minute. Um, oh, here's an interesting question. Uh, Susan, you might be able to answer this one. Is your organization, so I assume CIBC, taking any special precautions with so much of our workforce working remotely? Oh, goodness, yes. <laughs> we've, uh, we've actually internally launched, um, launched a, a special site for, for all of CIBC. It's our COVID-19 support site. And, uh, and we've been you know, looking at our policies and procedures. The good thing is that a lot of our, our policies in terms of working securely um, and, and a lot of our kind of cyber hygiene uh, elements that were in place before um, carry over very easily into kind of a, rem a remote workplace. There are, because we've also had a lot of people, I don't know if people realize that over the years, um, CIBC did get into a more flexible working style, uh, which was to do like hoteling, so you didn't have a desk and, and people working remote. So we'd had some experience with this. Um, but yeah, there there are some extra documents and and sort of extra reviews on things like which collaboration tools we use, for example, and Microsoft Teams is our, is our number one collaboration tool. I'm sure a lot of people heard about Zoom and in the early days of this crisis, there were some um, pretty scathing articles online about Zoom and, and their privacy policies. And um, I believe they've made significant changes now, but we, we have been assessing um, at a very uh, rapid, though still thorough pace to make sure we have the right tools in place uh, the right data loss prevention uh, setups in place. And there's no silver bullet, right? So our security has always been about multiple layers, right? Like layers of an onion. And uh, and those layers are, are still intact. And, and now we're just reaching out to to the actual um, CIBC base to make sure they, you know, they understand and, and continue to behave in secure ways. But also we provide the, the tech in the background to uh, to make sure that, that that all of that remains stringent and in place. So there are there are some definite uh, new considerations when it's such a, a much many more people working remote. But we had the benefit, as did as did many of the FIs, that we had some of those setups in place already. Right. Thanks, okay. 
We've had a few more questions come in. Um, and again, whether this is for Susan or Jack, not sure, but are there any end user training resources that you recommend to help educate uh, employees on the signs of a fraudulent communication? So within the bank, we have a lot of um, a lot of policy and procedures, as well as courses that that we have for all of the employees, and they have mandatory courses they have to take every year that really do go in depth on that. And we have a number of communications about that, and and we we run different kinds of simulations as well. For external folks, uh, I definitely suggest uh, you know going to the anti fraud sites, uh, the Canadian anti fraud site, as well as the um, as well as that CyberSafe program with the government, because there's a number of free resources that anyone can can leverage from there, as well as stuff that you can get into if you want to get into the program. Um, so we try to do this, and, and as well as that, uh, the link that's actually on the screen now that Jack mentioned, um, there are a number of tips and articles you can pull from that. Uh, if you navigate around a little, there are how to identify phishing, how to, well, try to identify phishing, how to, how to um, prevent against fraud, uh, COVID scams and things like that. It's it's actually uh, a pretty, um, I think, pretty uh, elaborate site that has quite a few things. And there's even some videos as you navigate around as well. So I definitely encourage people. And those, you don't have to log in to CIBC.com to get access to them. That's just from the outside. Um, you don't put in any credentials or anything. Um, that'll take you, the, the link will take you right there. But even if you went to CIBC.com, just underneath the panel where you would normally enter um, your credentials. There's actually a, a couple of links there. One is about our, our digital client guarantee as well as a security, um, privacy and security information. And if you click there, it'll take you right into all of this as well. And uh, Just one comment, uh, I would say not directly related to the question perhaps, but uh, if if uh, anyone on the line, uh, we, if, if you're interested, if you have an organization where you'd like uh, I'd like to say something in person, but but uh, with Susan's group mm -hmm. and, and my group in cash management and Steve's group in commercial banking, uh, if you reach out to us, we can make arrangements uh, to try to do something at, at your site when things get back to normal, to whether it's a lunch and learn, a one hour meeting where you gather your, your uh, people and we can do something similar to what we just did today, or, or a little bit more tailored to your specific questions. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion, Jack. And I, I don't think we have to wait till we get back to in-office uh, arrangements. I think we could probably use Microsoft Teams or mm -hmm. other virtual yep. sessions. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. So yeah. it's a priority. It's a, it is a priority, and we and we do want to help our clients. Um, I think we've got maybe a couple of minutes, so maybe one more question, Susan. And somebody asked a question about the topic of passwords. So, you know, could you maybe talk about strong passwords, password change rules, not reusing passwords, and perhaps using third-party password storage uh, facilities? Definitely. Um, yeah, passwords are, are one of my um, definitely most sensitive topics. Uh, first and foremost is please don't write them down. Um, we, we're kind of moving, we, we follow uh, the NIST framework, so it's the National Institute of, of Standards of Technology, and they used to be big proponents of highly complex passwords, which everybody will recognize, where you, you, know, you log into a site and you know, all you're trying to do is fill a grocery basket and it's asking you for a password that's 16 characters with three special characters, capitals, little ones, just kind of gone a little bit bananas. And, uh, and now NIST is moving more towards something that we're, we're trying to look at as well, which is um, both having uh, long passwords that don't necessarily have to go crazy on complexity, um, but it takes a my time to migrate to that, but long pass phrases. Um, so for example, uh, I had a peer in a previous job who wanted a new car. So their password was new Honda for me. But then a couple of the letters in there were swapped out with characters or or um, or numbers in order to make it a little bit more complex. And adding to that is the multi-factor authentication, which you're going to start seeing a lot more of, which is the, the adding of, so not just having a password, which is something you know, but also maybe a biometric, um, like a, a fingerprint scan or, or something like that, or a voice authentication in order to also uh, doubly authenticate into your accounts. Um, you'll see something like that. It's kind of like a step up authentication on like a CIBC.com. If you log into your account and you want to add a new payee that you're going to send an email transfer to, you have to 
um, do a, a one-time verification code on your cell phone or in your email, you'll get a text um, with a code. So those kind of multi-factor authentication, long, strong passwords that are easy to remember. In terms of um, frequency of changing them, it's it's that one is always a, a tricky one. So most systems are going to drive you to change in a particular time frame, but also realizing how many passwords we all have to remember these days. Um, some of those third-party password managers are pretty darn good, and and we don't particularly support one or the other because it's it's you never know um, how those you know what could happen with those companies, and we we tend to try to evaluate those those offerings and see if we can bring that in house as well. Um, we haven't settled on one as an organization, but uh, they are quite common, and and people who use them are are very pleased with them. I use them for. I have a, a password vault for some of my, um, what I would consider really inconsequential passwords to, you know, various periodicals or silly things that wouldn't ever have access to my bank accounts or anything. And that's just a personal preference. Everyone has to um, kind of evaluate their own risk and, and decide sort of where they where they feel uh, most comfortable. Um, but yeah, they, they are definitely um, growing in popularity and, uh, you know, you just have to make sure you don't forget the password to the password manager. That's a hopefully goes without saying because that becomes a problem. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely, you know, don't write them down. Don't put them on post-it notes and do not save them on your computer in a text file. It is the number one in terms of a hack that happens more frequently than than anyone cares to admit. Uh, if if a if a if a criminal of some kind, cyber criminal, threat actor gets into your network or into any kind of file system, the first thing they look for is text files called passwords, uh, and it's unbelievable how many people store them in a text file called passwords on their computers in plain text, which just means it's just typed out exactly how it would be. So, um, doesn't mean rename the file to you know something else like grandma's bread recipe it, it's literally about don't keep your passwords written down or typed out in plain text um and and yeah password managers are, are definitely an option there as well okay well listen uh, susan and jack uh, thank you very much for your presentation and the q a obviously cyber fraud is an uncomfortable topic uh, but given that it's a reality that public sector and not-for-profit organizations need to, need to deal with we certainly appreciate your thoughts. Um, and previously, we, we will send all of today's participants a copy of the presentation through your CIBC relationship uh, manager. We're also recording the webcast and you'll be able to access the recording for up to 90 days, likely starting by the end of the day today, using the same link that we included in the invitation. So if you think any of your colleagues or friends would be interested in watching the webcast, uh, please feel free to uh, share the invitation and the link with them. Also, our cash management team is in the process of developing a general fraud prevention tip sheet that will also circulate to you within the next few weeks. So uh, in closing, uh, our CIBC team would uh, like to thank you for participating today. And we'd also like to extend our appreciation to all, all of you who are with public sector, charitable, or not-for-profit organizations for the fantastic work you're doing to help us get through this pandemic. Although the country and the economy are starting to cautiously open up, we recognize that we're not out of the woods yet and that this continues to be a challenging time for many of you. So thank you very much for the terrific contributions you're making to help our communities manage through the COVID-19 crisis. We certainly hope that you're able to get back to a more normal state of operations and revenues as quickly as possible. And if there's anything that CIBC can do to help your organization, please contact your commercial banking relationship manager and we'll do whatever we can to provide assistance. And on that note, we'll conclude this webcast. So thank you very much, everyone.